military law applies to any person located in the occupied Palestinian territory. In practice, Israeli forces, Israeli authorities only apply military law to the Palestinian population. So Hello, I'm Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. As the countdown to climate catastrophe continues, Congress is not taking the drastic measures necessary to prevent climate killing gases from getting into the air. So coming on September 20th, young people are planning a large scale strike for the climate. We are we can continue with our business as usual. We want our politicians and politicians around the world to start recognizing the crisis that we're in and to start taking action. Fossil fuel agenda is dirty. We cannot do it anymore. Our house is on fire. As mentioned last week, a document with opinions about a chemical attack last year on Duma, Syria, has drawn a lot of interest. There were even two days coverage of it on Democracy Now! The writer of the document concluded that cylinders that killed 40 to 70 Syrians had not been airdropped as the OPCW that is, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, had concluded. Instead, the writer named Ian Henderson suggested that the two chlorine cylinders had been placed, one on a roof and one in a different building on a bed. Speaking about this document, some, like a retired MIT professor, claimed that the Duma attacks was not an attack by Assad forces, but a false flag operation done by some anti-Assad group on itself, and that the OPCW was covering this up. Clay Claiborne has been closely watching Syria for years and wrote an extremely detailed criticism of this claim of an OPCW conspiracy. I interviewed him on June 12th. At this point in the interview, I asked him about what the OPCW had concluded in its March 1st report of this year. That they concluded the people would die from chlorine exposure. That most likely the chlorine exposure had been air delivered, that is dropped. But they didn't make any predictions about the height, and they did not mention helicopters at all. They did not go into, they said, and, and, and in response, in fact, to uh, the Russians' uh, criticism or objections, they said, uh, uh, we deal only in assumptions. I mean, we do, we do not deal in assumptions, and we, they put that in bold. They said, we deal with facts and information. Mm -hmm. So, that was in their report, facts and information. Obviously, certain conclusions can be drawn once you, once you conclude that it's been air delivered, because we know who controls the airspace you know, over uh, Duma at that time and over Syria generally. Uh, and it's not the opposition, it's not the jihadists, and it's not the Free Syrian Army. There's no Free no, Syrian so Air Force. What does, what does Henderson say? The OPCW says, there was some airdrop 
and uh, 40 or more people died. Right. What does Henderson think? He looks at the data of the fact-finding mission. What's his conclusion? His conclusion is it couldn't possibly be dropped from a helicopter. Uh, therefore, it, that had to be manually placed there. So his conclusion is basically it was a false flag operation. Uh, did some people on the ground? He doesn't say who, but he draw. You know, everyone draws the conclusion it must have been the opposition. It must have been the jihadists uh, gassing their own people. Uh, interestingly enough, neither he nor the people supporting his theory feel a need to even go into how difficult it would be to manually place you know, two large orange or yellow chlorine cylinders that weigh who knows how many hundreds of pounds each uh, among the very people that you're going to murder. They don't address that at all. Imagine what it would take to carry these heavy chlorine cylinders up to the attic, detonate them in some way, escape unharmed while people were dying all about you without any of the survivors noticing anything of this. Duma is now in Assad hands, and to this day no one claims to have seen any of this supposed false flag attack. As Claiborne says, says elsewhere in the interview, the whole controversy is a distraction a distraction from the hundreds of people getting killed this year in Idlib by Assad and Russian bombs. See my full interview with Claiborne on our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. By the way, once you get to our channel, if you subscribe, you'll be able to get to the channel quicker in the future. It works like a favorites tab. In other Syria news, Abdul Basit al Sarut has been killed in fighting against Assad forces in Idlib. I did an interview about him with Yasser Munif, also available on our YouTube channel. As war jitters increase after attacks in the Persian Gulf that Secretary of State Pompeo attributes to Iran, this banner from a few years ago becomes, again, very relevant. We suggest younger people study the Gulf of Tonkin incident, that event in the middle 60s of a supposed North Vietnamese attack on the U.S. Navy led to a decade of war in Vietnam. Remember, the event we're having on Iran and Syria in New Haven. For details, see pepeace.org. At SaudiUS.org, we call attention to the case of a Saudi youth who faces death and body mutilation for an alleged crime he committed on a bicycle when he was 10 years old. A 36-year-old medical worker with the Palestine Red Crescent named Sobhi al-Jadili died a few days ago in the Gaza Strip. He had been shot in the head by a so-called rubber bullet by Israeli forces. He was shot in May and succumbed after a month. This is the fourth medical worker shot dead by Israelis during the Great Return March. Now a presentation by the Defense of Children International Palestine. And thank you all for coming. My name is Shana Lowe and I am the U.S. Advocacy Officer um, with Defense for Children International Palestine. I'm going to hand it over in just a couple minutes to my two incredible colleagues who I've spent the first half of this week um, traveling with to Washington, D.C. to um, engage in advocacy around H.R. 2407, a new piece of legislation that was recently introduced by Betty McCollum. Brad Parker, 
who um, oversees all of the U.S. programming and is a senior advisor at um, DCIP, will talk more about that. And we are very pleased to have uh, Farah Bayadzi, who's an attorney from Jerusalem who represents children uh, in the military courts uh, in, and in uh, Israeli civil courts who are arrested and detained by Israeli forces and, um, and tried in the military court system and civil system. Before I hand it over, I just want to thank two people for um, making this event happen. And um, there are actually a lot of you that made this event happen. But um, most importantly are Yusuf Aboudi and Faisal Saleh, who are um, incredible um, to open up the museum to us and give us a space to talk about um, what's happening to Palestinian children um, and their engagement with Israeli forces and, and the oppression that they face. Um, I also want to thank the folks who um, I was emailing with and corresponding with in the last couple of weeks who managed to get all of you out here to come and learn about the bill. So thanks to Shelly and Anne, and I know I'm forgetting, so Henry, is Henry here? No, he's not. Okay, he's not. well you can he's tell. He's engaged in Washington. Oh, okay. Well, Henry also I know was, I was emailing with at one point a couple weeks ago. So uh, with that, I will thank you all for coming and hand it over to my colleague, Brad Parker. Thank you. So it, it feels strange to stand here, but I'm going to do it for the video, as I think Yusuf will be more happy with the, is the, yeah, maybe I will, and I'll stay within the frame. Um, so it's nice to be here. Um, well, I'll stay. Oh, okay. In the, I'm not going to walk too far. <laughs> I just, the podium, yeah, I, yeah, anyway, here we are. Uh, so, hi. It's nice to be here. I see many familiar faces and folks that we've talked with over the years around uh, these issues and, and have been engaged in our No Way to Treat a Child campaign um, that DCI Palestine does jointly with the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, I know there's been a lot of work here in Connecticut, uh, reaching out to the Connecticut uh, congressional delegation, and uh, I think that work will pay off. <laughs> it is paying off. Um, and I think the things that are happening here are, have been models for uh, other folks throughout the country trying to have a statewide strategy to engage their policymakers around the issues that I'll talk about tonight. So um, I want to thank you for that work uh, and that strategizing <coughs> both through uh, congregations uh, and in the different groups everybody's a part of. It's, it's, it's really important and special uh, here in Connecticut uh, for the work that everybody's done. What I'm going to talk about sort of briefly before Farah comes up to share her experience uh, representing and defending Palestinian children um, in the Israeli military courts is I want to just give sort of an overarching context to military detention. Um, we have a short eight minute film, some of you have maybe seen already. We wanted to play that again just because it, we always try to include children's voices in the work that we do. Um, they're the ones being impacted. We want to highlight the human impact of occupation and, and bringing their voices. Um, so we'll, we'll play that. Um, but first, sort of thinking about the legal context. Um, you have three lawyers. Well, Shana needs to do our bar paperwork, but <laughs> uh, three lawyers. So the legal piece is, is very much a component of, of DCI Palestine's work. Uh, the context that uh, of the legal framework that applies throughout the Palestinian territory, uh, occupied Palestinian territory, is important because it's very much the legal arm of facilitating occupation and oppression. Um, so kind of the overarching piece that, that we always want people to sort of understand before we get into things deeper is that Israeli military law, right? Israeli forces occupied the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip in 1967. When they did so, they instituted a military law system. So military law applies to any person located in the occupied Palestinian territory. In practice, Israeli forces, Israeli authorities only apply military law to the Palestinian population. So if you're an Israeli settler, an Israeli citizen, living in the West Bank, you have the benefit and privilege of Israeli authorities uh, 
applying Israeli civilian law, which comes with enhanced protections, uh, generally meets international standards. But if you're Palestinian, right, the law that applies to you is, is subpar, uh, according to international standards. So the basic framework of sort of everything that we will discuss starts with this uh, disparity and hierarchy of rights uh, based on a person's identity. Um, the other sort of important piece to, to know is that Israel is unique because they are the only country in the world that automatically and systematically prosecutes kids in military courts. Uh, under international standards, customary international law, things that all states, all actors are bound by, um, all, all activity related to a child uh, should be, the primary consideration should be the best interest of that child. Along with that, and sort of an extension of that, is that detention must always be a measure of last resort. Uh, it is never, I mean rarely, close to never in a child's best interest to be detained, uh, separated from their families, held in a, a custodial detention situation. Um, you know, that's obvious, generally, to everybody. Uh, but what we have in the Israeli military detention system Pre-trial detention, custodial detention is the norm. Uh, bail is rarely provided. Um, if a child gets bail, it's usually the younger children, 12 to 13 years old. Um, but the majority of, of children detained by Israeli forces do not get bail. Right? They get detained and they're in pre-trial detention. And that period could be anywhere from a few days to a few weeks to several months, uh, depending on their age. Uh, so the significance of, of, kind of the disregard for these basic fundamental protections uh, that exist in international law, right, I think, is, is, is just completely systematic um, and intentional right, by Israeli forces. So I'll stop there. I want to play this uh, eight-minute film so we can um, see and hear from Obaida. Um, kind of a, a note on Obaida. Uh, Farah was his attorney. Um, Farah has sort of over the past year represented a number of the more high profile um, cases. So, uh, yeah, so Fauzi here in, in this photo, which uh, people have probably seen uh, on social media. Um, this is Fauzi al uh Farah's other client, uh, which maybe she'll talk more about. Um, so, let's meet Obaida. أول فكرة تفكر كيف بدك تطلع كيف دمجت أيامي تحس إنك لقيت جو كنت من عزة عن العالم الخارجي تماماً عندك خوف إنك تتسجن كمان مرة ولا اثنين تعرف شو المشكلة هالسيرة خمسة ستير إنه بس كيف تقطع وتفجر وخير لأنه عند خمسة ستير هم من في الشارع أنا عبيد أكرم جوابي مخيم مع الروم شمال الخليل قامت تقريبا من 15 سنة وحب أطبخ حب المخيم العروم بكل دور صغيرة والما عدد الأفراد اللي فيها كبير كثير وساحة الدور صغيرة وحتى إنه الشباك مثلا بتاع الشباك جارك يعني الحيط في الحيط يسموها عندك دور صغيرة عندك برضو الناس فيها كثير طيبين كثير مناح جدعان بوقف معك المشاكل في الحياة الأطفال ما أسويها لا في ألعاب زي العالم لا في حرية تم اعتقالي مرتي من قبل الاحتلال عندي كان تجربة أولى ما أسوي جدا حتى كنت أنا ماشي أروح عند دكان أشتري تأخذوني أما تقلون في مركز التحقيق حطوا لي كلبش بلاستيك كلب كلبشتين نفس اللي شيء نفس العيد حتى كان دي كنت بقدر أسحب كذي لا لفوق ولا تحت كان حطوا لي عصب خميدة وحتى حطوا لي مخارج من درجة أتنفس الصعوبة تعرف لما تمشي ب... انت مش شايف اشي طريق غريب ظلك ماشي وظلك في شيء دايخ وخايف وترد حتى هم كانوا ثانا يقول لي ثانا انزل الدرج وقاش في درج وقال ارفع رجلك ونخلون ارجع بس طبعا كانوا يضربش الا على المناطق الغير حساسة حتى ما تشهدش ضدهم او تثبتش اشارة ضدهم صارت اخطاء اشياء كثير لما قلت السجن وروحت شفت اشياء كثير متغيرة 
لما رجعت كانت المواد المواد كلها متراكمه جدا علي حتى انه ما عرفتش لا اختار لا هذا ولا هذا. يعني هاي مثلا ترتبها شويه هيك. لان في عندنا في عندنا انواع يتم تشكيلها بالبذور، في عندنا انواع في الفسائل بالعقل، كويس؟ هذا مثلا نوع من انواع النبات يتم تشكيله بايش؟ من خلال النبت نفسه، في عندنا التكاثر الجنسي في عندنا التكاثر اللا جنسي، كويس؟ فرحت على الصناعية عشان المواد برضه كانت المواد متراكمة جدا وعملوا لي امتحانات شهرين فتغلبت كثير كنت كل يوم بقيت اقرا كل كتاب. شو تعمل؟ تبني لك اثنين ميلي. اه. علامات عاليه لا وجود انه ما راحش تعبكوا هيك، ما راحش انكم قابلتوني مش راح تاثر علي بس. انا رشيد عرار المرشد المهني مدرسه العروب الزراعيه وزي ما احنا شايفين هون هذا الشارع شارع 60 اللي بمر منه كثير من المستوطنين اللي بيعملوا لنا اشكاليه كبيره في هذا المكان لانه احنا موجودين على ايش هذا الصوت؟ هذا الجرس احنا موجودين اعتداءات من من قبل قوات الاحتلال على الاطفال، اعتقالات، مداهمات للمدرسه الأطفال أول ما بيجوا سواء كان معتقل قبل ما يجي عنا أو بيتم اعتقاله عنا وبعدين بيلتحق بالمدرسة بنجد إنه في صعوبة أثناء دمجه مع الطلاب، يعني مش بالسهل إنه يتفاعل، مش بالسهل إنه يبني علاقات، مش بالسهل إنه يبني صداقات، مرات عنده ردات فعل مش محسوبة، هذا الموضوع بنشتغل عليه على إنه نعيده لتوازنه، نعيده لإنه يرجع يندمج مع الأطفال، يبني علاقات، ينتظم بالمدرسة، يتخلص من بعض السلوكيات اللي شوي بتأثر عليه من ناحية سلبية. بلشت افكر ليش احنا غير عن اطفال العالم؟ ليش بس تعيين فلسطين بروح بتسجلوا اعمارهم صغيره بندهقوا في الحياه وهم غالبا مبسوطين بروح على عجم على كرة سلة على تدريبات لهم امكانيات كثير احسن منا. كنت اقارن كيف ليش هم هيك واحنا هيك. هذا السؤال لحد الان ما حدا جاوبني عليه. عشان اشرب المواد العلمية في زركية وحيات صعبات صعبات كثير اه انا صرت منها ومنيح زراعي طبيب محترم ورا مكتب وتشتغل لحالك وقال نفسك انا هذا الشيء اللي بحبه بس عملت نفسك احسن صحيح اما كنا جوا بس نفكر بس يوم نطلع محكمة عشان هيك نضيع وقت اه الزراعة احيانا اه الزراعة احيانا بنشوف بلاد بلاد في يوم مصر اه بلاد بلدنا ويوم الزيارات وهيك يوم الزيارة تشوف اهلك هي الاشياء المنيحة في السجن الشيشة منيحة الشيشة منيحة هو بس في اشياء بتعلمك انه اه زي الصبر في اللعب زي تصبر تنظم حالك كنت انا مروق في السجن كنت جوا شف وتعبت اه بعد ما عملنا الطبخ حد اللي سابوا عملنا الطبخ وعندنا كان جابوا شف من الاقسام الثانية انه اطلع ثلاثة اثنين معهم اسمه مساعد الطباخ فاشتغلنا معه وعلمنا شغله شغله تعلمت مهاره الطبخ وتعلمت التعاون مهاره التعاون مع الناس الادب الاحترام بحس حالي حر بس مش الحريه الثانيه عندك لازم اول شيء تتحرك عشان احس حالي حر تماما بس برضه في عندك انك تحر تطلع وقتها بدك تيجي وقتها بدك تتفسي تحكي مية بدك تزاعم مية بدك كان عندك خلاص إرادة الشخصية شو بدك تسوي أنا هذا كنت فتقني جوا 
بس واحد مش متحررين كيف بدي أعيش الفرحة تمام مية مية يعني حتى جزء من الفرحة كانت More of this presentation next week. In response to an announced plan to cut 30, 53 teaching positions in the New Haven school system and transferring teachers all about, there were a number of protests, including school walkouts. This led to a packed school board meeting where a lot of people wore red for Ed. June 10th looked to be a very contentious New Haven School Board meeting. Superintendent Carol Burks had notified the community that 53 teaching positions were being eliminated and those teachers were being moved to vacant slots. Students engaged in a number of protests. The latest last Friday when 100 students at the Cooperative Arts and Humanities High School staged a silent walk out of classes. The board meeting was a chance for the teachers and public to make a statement and scores of people signed up to speak. Near the start of the meeting, the school board broke for a short private executive session. Kristen, how do you feel about this question of these uh, closing of positions, 53? I think it's a horrible decision. We have, um, we're losing <laughs> positions. Um, the teacher, the class size is going to be bigger. Also, a lot of electives won't be taught anymore. And it's been done improperly in violation of the teacher's contract. Then came a surprise. Board member Dr. Edward Joyner made a motion. That we will not accept the superintendent's plan for transferring teachers that we would look at this within the context of a larger budget mitigation process. Essentially, he proposed stopping the transfers. The motion? Yeah. It passes unanimously. Yeah. So for the time being, the positions are saved. The student and public outpouring worked. The squeaky wheel does get the grease. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.